Welcome back to Behind the Play. My name is Alex Adams, and today I'm very excited to introduce our guest, John Molinaro, the founder of TFC Republic, one of maybe the OGs of covering uh, soccer in Canada. Thanks so much for, for taking the time and coming on. Sure, no problem. Um, I first wanted to just ask a little bit about when did you first think you might want to pursue a career in, in sports journalism and writing? Um, well, those are two sort of different things because they didn't actually coincide. I, I, I kind of knew I wanted to be a writer first and then the sports journalism came sort of second. Mm -hmm. um, so my aunt uh, Florence was uh, an investigative reporter for oh. the Hampton Spectator. And so, and we were very close. And so um, just reading her articles as a kid and, and you know talking to her, that kind of inspired me to get into journalism. Um, and the sports journalism didn't really sort of happen until um, just after I began my journalism career. So for, for the longest time, what I wanted to be was uh, was a music critic mm. and write, you know, album reviews and whatnot and just sort of cover, you know, popular music. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I set out to do. But on my first job, which was working for Sun Media um, on the online division, I did some of I did some of that, but um there, there was sort of more opportunities for for a young writer as myself who just came out of J school to to do sports coverage and I just started doing more and more sports and it just sort of led one thing to another and uh kind of forgot about being the music writer and just focused full-time on sports so I think it's worked out okay for me so and and when you went into sports like now you you cover soccer but was it was it always soccer? Was it hockey, basketball, baseball? How did you kind of get a start in, in the sports? Yeah, it was it was a little bit of everything, uh, but mostly I sort of focused on soccer. And um, I think that's just, you know, I think the more that I did that, because that's sort of my passion, right? I mean, it's, it's a sport that I followed since a kid. And... You know, there's not many sort of even back. Well, now there's not many soccer writers. I mean, back then there was even fewer. And so I think, you know, the outlets that I worked for. So I worked for, as I said, Sun Media and then CBC Sports before moving on to Sportsnet. Um, I think they just appreciated the fact that I was one of the few you know people in the country writing about soccer. So it just sort of focused more and more on that as time went by. And essentially, when I moved from CBC to Sportsnet in 2011, that's when I went full time with soccer coverage, and I've you know haven't written about another sport, God, you know, in the, in the longest time. And and what's it been like to see kind of can soccer as someone who's been covering it for so long to kind of change into what it's now like with the MLS, with the men's national team making the World Cup, with the women winning the gold medal. What's that kind of kind of uh, change in the soccer landscape in Canada been? For you, have you noticed a huge difference? Um, yes and no. <clears throat> um, it's been, I think it's still sort of a fight for the sport to get sort of mainstream coverage and sort of break through the stranglehold that, that you know, the NHL and, you know, the Raptors and the Blue Jays have in terms of, you know, this is the soccer or sort of the sporting media landscape in the country. But I don't think there's any question that the fact that there's now you know, three professional MLS teams. There's a Canadian Premier League with teams from literally coast to coast. You know, the Canadian men's team qualified for the first World Cup in 36 years and has players the caliber of Jonathan David and Alfonso Davies and Tejon Buchanan. The women winning three Olympic medals in a row and, you know, gold in Tokyo. Um, it's led to sort of more awareness and more opportunities and just, to, you know, improved coverage. I still think it's, I still don't think it is where it should be, but hmm. I don't think there's any doubt that it's a lot better than it was, um, you know, when I first started in, you know, well, it would be 24 years ago. So, What's kind of the main difference from when you started to now in terms of the coverage of, of, of soccer in Canada? <clears throat> I think the appetite for it. I okay. think, um, I think, I think it's all, it's always been sort of a popular sport in, in the, in the country. But I think, you know, primarily before it was centered around sort of other national teams, right? So, you know, 
I think one of the great things about the country is that we're we're a country of, of immigrants. And you know, I think people come here and they assimilate and they become, you know, card carrying Canadians, but they still mm -hmm. uh, maintain, you know, connections to their to their um, to their birth nations. And so, you know, there was always this sort of appetite to watch, you know, if you were Italian to watch Serie A games or whenever Italy played, or if you were England to watch Premier League games and, and English national team games. So that was always there. I think now there's more of an appetite to watch, you know, Canadian players and Canadian teams, uh, much more so than there was before. You know, we've always had Canadian national teams, both on the men's and women's side, but I think now, whereas people identified as, you know, Italian fans or French fans or Belgian fans or whatever. I think now there's more and more, you know, soccer fans in this country identifying themselves as Canadian fans, which, you know, I think is an encouraging sign. I guess with that, is that, do you think mostly due to the past kind of Canada making the World Cup this or last fall, I guess, winter and, and the women winning the gold or is, has that been kind of a slow moving burn or is it kind of all come to the the like risen to the top since all those successes for the men's and women's national team no i think it's been a slow kind of moving burn i mean i don't have any doubt that the success of the men's and the women's teams you know over the last whatever it is several years have played a part in that but i think it began long before then and i think it's just sort of continued on and it's you know i think it's helped that you seeing so many sort of canadians both on the men's and women's side sort of succeeding not just for their national teams but at club level when you think about alfonso davies playing for bayern munich one of the biggest clubs in the world when you mm -hmm. think about players like jesse fleming and kadisha buchanan winning you know trophies at uh you know chelsea and olympic lyon um ashley lawrence playing at psg um, Jonathan David, you know, lighting up the the scoring title race in, in Ligue 1 with Lille and Tejan Buchanan going to Belgium. Um, you know, this has been sort of a slow progr pro pro uh, progress. And so I think it's started long before, you know, what the, what the women and the men have accomplished from a team perspective in the last couple of years. But again, I don't think there's any doubt that the success of the men's and the women's side has played a part in this as well and pushing along further forward. I I want to I want to ask you about the CSA a little bit and and in Canada like Canada soccer as an organization obviously the men's and women's national teams have both they've been on strike I think both teams have in the past year um, there's now obviously uh, Nick Bontis and Victor Montagliani are um, uh, talking to Parliament tomorrow I believe. Um, and there's just a lot of strife between the two national teams um, and and the CSA. Where do you see kind of all of that kind of heading? And and maybe does there need to be a change, kind of a kind of complete teardown of Canada soccer um, to really change what seems to be inadequate kind of um, funding and, and maybe not even documenting and telling the players how to be paid and everything like that? I'm, you know, I'm probably in the vast minority on this because I know a lot of sort of, you know, the players will say that there's hope for the future and CSA officials say there's hope for the future. And, and there seems to be a lot of fans and, and sort of media colleagues who think there's hope, hope for the future. Um, I'm quite the opposite. I'm pretty pessimistic about it. Um, I think the divide between the players and the CSA is too great that I'm not sure it can be that divide can be shrunk when, you know, Christine Sinclair and her teammates testified in Ottawa uh, a couple of weeks ago, they talked about a culture of, you know, obstruction and secrecy and, uh, you know, Jonathan Osario has, has mentioned that, you know, that the, the relationship between the players and the CSA is fractured and that there's very little trust. I don't know how you repair that. I don't, I don't know how mm -hmm. with everything that's gone on, you know, we're talking, this isn't sort of a new development. This isn't something that's just happened over the last two or three years. We talked to players who played for the national teams in, you know, the eighties and nineties, whether it's Craig Forrest or Jim Brennan or Amy Walsh or Carolina Moscato or, or whoever. And they will talk about these sort of longstanding issues with Canada soccer. And, you know, they're oftentimes they're having the same sort of, 
the same complaints that they had back then they have now. So I don't know what the answer is. I don't, I mean, I wish I was smart enough to say, yeah, this is what needs to be done and, and hopefully they can move on from here. Um, but I don't know what the answer is. Um, hmm. Tearing it all down doesn't seem plausible either because the, you need some sort of organizing body. Um, and I don't know, I, I think Canada soccer's main problem is just the lack of, it's not a professional organization. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the president and sort of the board members, th these are voluntary positions. These are not sort of paid positions. Um, so I, I don't know how you can effectively run an organization when it's not professionally sort mm -hmm. of built up to, from, from, to begin with. And when you look at how they sort of make their money, it's primarily off of, you know, fees from registration fees from kids playing soccer across the country. It's from, you know, CONCACAF and FIFA by playing in international tournament tournaments and grants. Um, it's from registration fees from the pro clubs. And, you know, it's, it's also, and under normal circumstances, it would be from, um, uh, you know, broadcast and sort of commercial sort of rights, but they don't even have that coming in because of the deal that they signed with Canadian soccer business. Essentially they've, you know, that, that third party controls all the revenue coming in for, from broadcast and commercial sort of inventory, mm -hmm. you know, in return, they pay Canada soccer a guaranteed minimum every year between three and 4 million, but they're leaving money on the table. I would think with all the success of the men's and women's teams that, you know, the commercial rights would be substantially more than three to $4 million every year, mm -hmm. but they sign this long-term deal, a nine-year deal where CSB has the right to turn it over for another 10 years. So they could be locked into this for potentially yeah. two decades. So it doesn't seem like the brain trust of Canada soccer are thinking long-term or, or, or or just have sort of the business acumen to navigate uh, through everyday life. So, as I said, I, I don't know what the answer is, and I'm quite pessimistic. I think you know the labor disputes and um, everything that the, the sour relationship between the two sides is going to continue on for quite a long time. I guess just a quick follow up: Do you think kind of the oversight at Parliament might have an effect, or is that more kind of? just broader in terms of transparency and maybe revealing some of the kind of, you said, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think it's going to have any effect. I mean, I've, I've kind of watched both sessions and I've been completely unimpressed with the performance of the MPs. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of grandstanding. It can tell that they haven't done, um, you know, a great, great deal of research and that they're out of their, and, and I appreciate it, you know, International soccer isn't the easiest thing to sort of get your head around for a novice. So I understand that, but sort of the law, the, the, the lack of sort of research and preparation I found has been, you know, shocking. Um, and sort of the grandstanding. And I mean, like, look, we're all proud of the women's team. I don't think, I don't think that that's yeah. in, dis I think that, you know, they should be lauded. Statues should be built of them across the country, but that entire first session when the women's players was just the fawning over the players and you make us proud and you're so brave to come here. And, you know, half of the MPs time was just sort of tripping over themselves to pat the Canadian women's teams players on the back. You know, could you not have just said issued one sort of statement at the beginning of the thing, stipulating everyone. We're so proud of you. Thank you for coming. You're doing a great job and go from there. But every MP had to make it a point of, you know, getting there, there you know, of just sort of being on record of how proud they are. And it was just, again, it was over the top. And, you know, it's ask some hard questions. I mean, ask, you know, really get drilled down into the matter. And they didn't seem sort of all that interested in that. So I don't think anything substantial is going to come out of this. It might bring some stuff to light and some transparency. But in terms of wholesale changes, I don't believe it's going to have any effect. Mm -hmm. And And you mentioned the CSB deal that kind of created this Canadian Premier League. What impact do you think the Canadian Premier League is, will have and has had on Canadian soccer with Canada now having a domestic league? Uh, it's a good thing. Um, obviously, you know, 
it's providing opportunities for Canadian players that otherwise wouldn't have the chance to play professional soccer, a chance to sort of cut their teeth. Um, you know, I think, you know, and that's a good thing. And I think the longer that the seed that the, that the league is around, then it's going to sort of serve as a developmental league and sort of kind of create, you know, pl create more players for the, for the men's national team player pool. I don't think we're, we're, we're definitely not at a point now where we're going to, where, you know, the league can sort of feed players directly to John Herdman. I mean, there's no one in the Canadian Premier League that can walk into the, into the Canadian roster right now, but it can produce players like Dominic Zator, who played for, you know, Calvary and York United, who is now with a Polish team in the first division. And he was recently called up for these most recent games by Canada. So I don't think it's going to, I don't foresee it providing a direct pathway to the national team anytime soon, but I do think it will provide a pathway. Um, I think m my criticism would be that it's great that they're doing this for the men, but why didn't they, when the league launched in 2019, why wasn't there a similar league launched for, for the women? You know, it's up to, you know, Diana Matheson now to sort of take things by the, by the horn and, and line up investors and, um, you know, launch a league in, in 2025. I think it's absolutely shameful that it came to that. It shouldn't have come to that. It should have been something that Canada soccer and Canadian soccer business spearheaded. It should have been, you know, when, when the CPL was granted its licensing uh, from, from the Canadian soccer league, it should have been under the, you know, with the condition that you had to have, you know, similarly launched a women's league or had a firm plan in place with a firm timeline to, to launch a women's league. You know how they how they got away with that. It, yeah, I think it's disgraceful. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, um, uh, I think that's something that they should hang their head heads about. Are, are you optimistic that Project Eight, which you mentioned, like the new um, domestic women's league, will kind of come into effect? And and what impact would a women's league have on the like women's soccer in Canada? I am optimistic about it. I think, you know, having Diana Matheson involved in it, um, that's what sort of leads me to have great optimism about it because she's a very smart woman. This is obviously something that's very near to, and dear to her heart. She's very passionate about it. She's invested in this. And like, she, I think she knows that she can't afford to like to, to fail with this. And, you know, the fact that she's lined up already, um, you know, sponsors in the form of what is it, CIBC and Tim Hortons and I think BMO, um, or Canadian Tire, sorry. Um, you know, that's pretty significant. Those are pretty significant corporate partners. And so that leads me to to believe that, you know, there's there's hope for this. And I think there's just a groundswell of support for women's sports in general. That mm -hmm. that's just sort of the way things are trending and that, you know, sort of sports organizations and countries have to get on board with this. So because there's a demand for the product. So that's why I'm so optimistic about it. And, you know, when it happens, again, I think it's going to be huge for the Canadian women's team because, you you know, you're talking about expanding the player pool available to Bev Priestman or whoever the future coach of the women's team is. It's giving opportunities to to young girls to, to play professionally and cut their teeth and, you know, maybe move on to a higher level. So... Yeah, I think it, it it can be nothing but positive uh, from a developmental perspective for for Canadian women's soccer in the country. And obviously, the women's team has had so much success, as we mentioned, and and the World Cup is coming up this summer. They're in a they're in a group with Ireland, Australia, Nigeria. What should the expectation expectation sorry be for this women's side at the World Cup after winning the gold medal in, in 2021? Well, again, I, I'm I'm pessimistic about this. I don't have much hope that they can win it. To be perfectly honest, I think getting out of the group, sure, that's absolutely a um, should be the goal, and I think that can be achieved. Um, but I think with everything going on with you know behind the scenes with the labor sort of dispute and its relationship with Canada Soccer, um, I question whether they're going to be really prepared for this because of just you know. Uh, you know they've had their budget cut and can they sort of get up to speed you know they don't less even have games planned yeah too. i mean they're yeah. going to play france in april and but um and there's another window in 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 june and july but 
I question whether they can get prepared between now and then. And I think just historically, when you look at it, Canada hasn't really sort of um, been all that great at the World Cup. They reached the semifinals in 2003, but that was 20 years ago. Since then, it's been mostly first round exits. Even when they staged the tournament in 2015, they got to the quarterfinals, but I think there was a sense that they underachieved there, that, that you know, that there was more for them to do. Um, you're talking about players who have been out with long-term injuries with um, Jade Riviere and Deanne Rose, uh, and now Janine Becky is going to be out for the year and she's going to miss the World Cup. And those players re- who are returning from long-term injuries, are you know, are they going to be up to match fitness? I don't doubt the resolve of the of the women's team. Um, I think they're going to give everything they got, and and you know, I think Tokyo showed that they can overachieve at times. And I do think you know, I don't think anyone reasonably expected them to win gold in Tokyo, but they did, and they were fantastic for it, and they were full value for it. But I think the World Cup is is it's another step entirely. It's a much harder difficult. It's a much harder tournament to win just because of there's more travel involved. There's um, a wider range and different opponents uh, to play with different styles. And I just think everything going on with Canada soccer is going to sort of hurt them in the long run. So I, I really have doubts about whether they can go on a lengthy run in Australia, New Zealand. And and to move to the to the men's team, obviously they, they beat Honduras last night very emphatically now in the semifinals of the nation's league, what did you think of their performance in this window and, and how important would it be for them to win a a trophy in in the nation's league or maybe even the gold cup this summer? Yeah, I thought they looked pretty solid. I mean, it's, it's hard to sort of look at their two games against Curacao and Honduras and not say that, you know, they were full value for both wins. Uh, You know, I think I was, you know, I was impressed with, the way that Kyle Lahren and Jonathan David played up front. I thought, you know, the midfield trio, trio of Stephanie Eustachio and Ishmael Coney and Jonathan Osorio was sensational. Scott Kennedy being back in the, in the team and sort of anchoring the back line was, uh, was an important uh, development. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it showed that, you know, qualifying for the World Cup and finishing first in the CONCACAF qualifiers wasn't a fluke. And that, you know, they're firmly established as one of the best teams in the region alongside Mexico and the United States, and they're here to stay. Um, and, you know, look, winning Nations League or the Gold Cup, that's sort of the next step. And John Herdman and Stephanie Stockio talked about it this week. He said, it's great to win all these sort of qualifying games, but if we don't sort of actually win anything in terms of tournaments or trophies, then, you know, what are we doing this for? What, what's the point of all of it? So that's the next step, right? I mean, it's, you know, actually winning hardware and taking it to the next level and making more of a name for themselves on the international stage is, is, is you know, the next gap that they have to overcome. Mm-hmm. And and also going forward as well, they might have to make it to the Copa America. Like they, they, they're probably going to be um, going there. They have to win a Nations League quarterfinal, I believe, next in the fall. How important would that also be? I know John Herdman's talked about they need to play better teams, not just CONCACAF teams. How important would it be for them to play teams on not just the USA and, and Mexico um, in potentially Brazil, Argentina, and other really good South American teams? Massive. I mean, absolutely massive. I mean, when you look at since John Herdman took over in 2018, the overwhelming majority of their games have been against CONCACAF opponents. I think there's only been about four, maybe five games against teams outside of the region. Um, you know, that's not good enough. They've got to test themselves against the likes of, you know, Brazil and Argentina and Colombia and Belgium and England. They can't sort of move on to the next level just by playing CONCACAF opponents, even if it is sort of the elite nations of the group of, of the region, whether it's the United States or Mexico, they really have to test themselves against the very best teams from the rest of the world, whether that's, um, you know, Europe or South America or Asia or Africa. Uh, nothing is to be gained by playing, you know, CONCACAF teams over and over again. Um, they have to take the next step in their development. And the only way to do that is by playing the very best nations and the very best players in the world. And we saw that kind of bear out in the World Cup where brilliant against Belgium, but couldn't get the result. And then, you know, pretty much outclassed by 
Morocco and and Croatia, especially against the Croatia Croatia game, where you know that midfield of, of Modric and uh, Brazovic and Kovacevic, you know, how do you compete against that? <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, Canada was just not up to snuff. So I think it's pretty clear that they have to face a better caliber caliber of uh, opponents on a consistent basis going forward. Mm-hmm. And um, you mentioned John Herdman. He he was linked to the New Zealand job. Um, he's now come <clears> up and said that, like, he obviously refuted it, but he also said there was other jobs that he was offered. I thought his World Cup, as you mentioned, was pretty up and down, maybe, in, in his selections. How likely is it that John Herdman is the manager in 2026 when Canada plays its first game of the tournament on home soil? Yeah, I'm kind of 50-50 on this one. I mean, on the one hand, I think, you know, who walks away from a home World Cup, right? I mean, I'm sure it's happened before, maybe, like a, a coach quitting. I mean, certainly there's been home, there's been host nations who have fired their coach before World Cup. But I mean, you know, from him actually walking away to to, to go to another opportunity, I don't know if that's ever happened before. And I just think he's you know, he's been here a long time, having coached previously with the women's side, got Canada to the World Cup for the first on the men's team for the first time in 36 years. I think he wants to see this through. I think he wants to sort of, you know, lead his team, you know, out out through the tunnel in Vancouver and Toronto and have see his the men's team play a World Cup game on home soil. On the other hand, I know he's frustrated with Canada soccer. Mm-hmm. You know, I know that he's... Um, you know, he's had to go himself, hat in hand, to to sort of raise funding for, you know, training camp programs or whatever. And a national team coach shouldn't be doing that. No. Um, you know, so I just wonder if the frustrations have, have are close to reaching the boiling point where, you know, he's soon going to say, "Look, screw this. I've got other opportunities. I don't need this. I can go somewhere where it's not a rinky-dink organization. I can get everything that I need." So. I do kind of wonder whether that'll happen. So I'm, like I said, I'm 50, 50 on it. I could, I could see him sticking around. Mm -hmm. I could also see him stick, uh, you know, deciding to leave. Now let's talk about TFC, the the team you cover quickly before I let you go. They've had a kind of up and down season to start the year. What have you made of their season uh, so far? I think they're one, three and one with the three draws this year. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think all things considered, I think it's been you know a pretty decent start to the season. I appreciate that the opening game against DC United was um, you know a heartbreaker loss because they they had the, the win and then they tossed it away by conceding two late goals. Um, but you know, other than that, I think I've seen the team improve and go from strength to strength with each passing game, getting better and better. And I think there was there was bound to be some hiccups at at the beginning of the season because you know. There's the retool the starting eleven, right? I mean, mm-hmm. four of the guy, four of the back five, um, Sigurd Roasted, Matt Hedges, Raul Petretta, and goalkeeper Sean Johnson, they're all new players. Adama, Adama Diamande, the forward, a new guy. So that's five, essentially five new starters in, in the starting eleven. You can't expect them to come out of the gate when and sort of hit on all cylinders. When these guys have essentially had one sort of preseason training camp together, it takes time. So I think patience is required. And I think people are just going to have to wait and see how this plays out a little bit. But from what I've seen so far over the course of the first five games, I think there's been a progression there. And I can see this team, I think it's trending in the right direction. So, you know, I think if I was a TFC fan, I'd be pretty hopeful that, uh, you know, Bob Bradley is is leading the team in the right direction. And if, like, as a if you are a TFC fan, what are your kind of expectations for this team going forward? Like, is it playoffs? Is it to be a championship contender? Obviously, Insignia has been injured since the first game. What are the expectations for this team? I think playoffs is a bare minimum. I think they have to get into the playoffs after you know missing out on the last two years. And you know, I would suggest that they have to like at least win one of the knockout games, like go to the second round. Um. I think, you know, winning the Canadian championship and getting back into the Concord Calf Champions League uh, next season is, is, you know, bare minimum require or requirement. I think they just have to sort of not necessarily get back to that sort of golden age between 2016 and 2019, where they reached three out of four MLS Cup finals. But 
I think they have to get back to that sort of attitude, that sort of, you know, back then, every time they stepped on the pitch, they expected to win. You know, games were lost before a ball was even kicked because team opposed opponents were so intimidated by them. I think they have to find a way to get back to that being that team um, and being really sort of tough to play. So I think if they can show that, then success on the pitch will, will soon follow. Um, Toronto FC has a bunch of young Canadians on the team, kind of with the academy. And who, who this year has been kind of the best young player, or who do you foresee to being the best young Canadian on TFC uh, this year? Well, it, it's a tough one because you know Bob Bradley, you know, really since last summer has kind of gone with a more veteran team, right? Um, and sort of young players have found playing time harder to come get come found playing time harder to come by mm -hmm. and that's been by design i think he just wants more experienced players and so guys like um luca petrasso who was a starter at the beginning of last season you know lost his place when um domenico crescito came in and then was eventually traded jay nelson did really well last year had kind of breakout campaign but he was sold to rosenberg shaquille marshall ruddy um, you know, played on Saturday, uh, but that was his first taste of action this year. Did quite well. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know. I mean, I don't I don't necessarily think, I mean, maybe Marshall Ruddy, but I think it's just going to be really difficult for young players in this team, for the foreseeable future anyway, to really sort of break through and make a, a statement for themselves just because of Bob's preference for using more experienced veteran players. Um, and, and just before I let you go, I know there was rumors that Insigne might be unhappy and might want to leave, but also they kind of were squashed. What have you made to Insigne's kind of start to his TFC career? Um, it's been okay. I mean, I look, I think I, I don't have the stats in front of me, but like last year, whatever, whatever number of games he played, I thought he, you know, he did well and produced enough goals and assists and was a part of you know, a lot of the team's best attacking moments that, you know, you could see, okay, this is why we spent the money we we spent on him. Um, you know, this year has been an entirely different story because of the injury situation. Mm -hmm. He's only played about 34 minutes. So I appreciate some people are frustrated, but, you know, players get injured and he's not, he's not 21. He's 32, 33, yeah. 34. I, I, off the top I mean, of my head, I don't know. So, I think it, it could be wrong. Yeah. That's probably it. Yeah. So it's going to take time for him to recuperate and you don't want to rush an injury, uh, rush a guy like that back from injury because, you know, if he comes back too soon, then he's going to aggravate and he's going to be out for even longer. So I appreciate fans are frustrated, but again, I think the temperature has to be lowered here and just sort of be a little patient, you know, and wait to see, you know, what happens when he gets fully healthy and he gets a full run of games under him. If when he comes back and he goes, you know, he doesn't produce, then by all means, let's let's have a discussion about that. Then people can be rightly upset. But I don't think, it, you know, I don't understand this sort of this kind this narrative about he hasn't lived up to expectations yet when he's barely played, and a large part of it is because he's injured. Let's give it some time. Well, thank you so much, John, for for taking the time and coming on. I just want to give you the floor. Is there anything you want to plug or keep listeners or eyes and ears open for anything that you want to kind of shout out? Um. Not much. Just thanks for having me on. And um, you can read my work at uh, tfcrepublic.ca if you're a, a fan of Toronto FC or the Canadian men's and women's teams. I do in-depth coverage there. And uh, yeah. Well, thank it's you so good. thank you so much, John, for uh, coming on. And I uh, hope you have a great rest of the TFC and uh, uh, season. Thanks. Thanks for having me on.